Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, Iran could have a nuclear bomb in just two weeks. This according to the 2023 report on strategy for countering weapons of mass destruction. The report notes that Iran has the capacity to produce enough fissile material for a nuclear device in less than two weeks. It also raised concerns over Tehran's pursuit of dual-use central nervous system acting chemicals, which it notes are being developed for offensive purposes. Moshe Edri, the director general of Israel's Atomic Energy Commission, sounded the alarm over Iran's military nuclear program in his briefing to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Edri said that the full attention of the international community must be focused on stopping Iran's nuclear weapons activity. He said Iran is the spearhead of regional instability and a threat to peace and security worldwide. Saudi Arabia has hosted its second Israeli delegation in a sign of the rapidly advancing ties between Riyadh and Jerusalem. Shlomo Kari, Israel's Minister of Communication, traveled to the Gulf state with 13 other Israeli representatives to attend the Universal Postal Union's 2023 Extraordinary Congress. Kari's trip came on the heels of the first ever official Israeli delegation to the Royal Kingdom, led by Israel's Minister of Tourism just one week before. This latest visit took place during the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. Kari and his team read from the Torah and recited special prayers while holding the four species as the Bible commands. The group was also invited to celebrate Sukkot in the tabernacle of Saudi activist Mohammed Saud, who is a staunch supporter of Israel. Kari released a message from the tarmac in Riyadh saying he's excited to play a role in bringing peace closer between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant is set to meet with his American counterpart, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, in Washington, D.C. Austin invited Gallant to the White House later this month, where the top security officials are slated to discuss developing security challenges, as well as opportunities in the Middle East region. Austin and Gallant have worked closely together since Gallant's appointment as defense minister. This will be their third meeting in just 10 months, and experts believe that it will focus on the Iranian nuclear threat and the advancing Saudi-Israeli normalization accords. More than 10,000 Jews marched to Joshua's altar on Mount Ebal to protest the Arab desecration of the biblical site. Mount Ebal is located north of the modern Arab city of Nablus. The ancient altar, as well as dozens of other holy sites in areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority, have been repeatedly vandalized. The PA has advanced plans to construct a road on the mountain, paving over the first altar built by the Israelites in the land of Israel. Yossi Dagan, the head of the Samaria Regional Council, said the PA is attempting to erase the connection of the Jewish people to their land and their roots. Israel has signed a $3.5 billion agreement to provide defense technology and equipment to Germany. This is Israel's largest defense deal to date. Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and his German counterpart signed the contract to provide Israel Aerospace Industries' Aero 3 missile defense system to Berlin. Germany has agreed to pay $600 million up front to begin production on the systems. The first one is scheduled to be delivered in 2025. Boaz Levy, the CEO of IAI, said that he is proud to sign the agreement with Germany, which he called a historic event and a significant milestone. He explained that the Aero Weapons System is the first in the world to allow interception of ballistic missiles outside the atmosphere to protect against strategic threats. Archaeologists excavating in Israel's Judean desert have discovered an ancient Christian inscription. The etching, written in Byzantine Greek script, was found in a fortress built by Hasmonean ruler John Hyrcanus or his son in the first century before the Common Era and later rebuilt and enlarged by King Herod the Great. It's marked with a cross and experts believe it was likely written by a very knowledgeable early Christian monk no later than the sixth century of the Common Era. Christian themes were added to the altered text, which was taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 86, verses 1 and 2. Dr. Avner Ekar from the Barlan University deciphered the writing and explained that this psalm holds a special place in the Masoretic text as a designated prayer 
and is one of the most frequently recited psalms in Christian liturgy. The Jerusalem municipality has inaugurated its newly constructed Shazar Tunnel, opening a major thoroughfare from the entrance of the Holy City to the city center. The 730-meter tunnel will divert traffic from the renowned Cords Bridge underneath the new business district to the bustling Agrippus Junction. Work continues on the massive underground parking structure situated at the entrance to Jerusalem, which will hold 1,300 cars. This car park is situated just steps from Jerusalem's central bus station, the new business center, railway, and light rail lines. The Shazar Tunnel will relieve congestion in what was once the bottleneck entrance to Jerusalem from the west. A shipment of Iranian weapons en route to Lebanon was attacked outside of Damascus. The hardline Islamic Republic has been working to supply weapons and strengthen its proxy armies in Lebanon and Syria. Israel has made no comment on its involvement in the raid, but the IDF has repeatedly warned that it will not tolerate Iranian entrenchment on its borders. Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, recently released a picture of an Iranian airport in Lebanon constructed just 12 miles from Israel's northern border. Gallant explained that the facility is being used for terror purposes. Officials from Rabat and Jerusalem have signed an agricultural agreement that will increase cooperation between their nations. Israel's Minister of Agriculture, Avi Dichter, explained that the Declaration of Intent on Agricultural Cooperation is a significant step in the plan to expand Israel and Morocco's international food security network. He said the countries share common agricultural interests, along with challenges in other fields. He praised the ever-increasing ties between Israel and Morocco, saying that thanks to the warm relations, we have managed to reach wonderful places together. The agreement involves cooperation, including support for private agrotech companies, the development of food supply chains, rural development, and agricultural production in drought conditions. This is only the latest in a series of agreements between the countries since Morocco joined the Abraham Accords, normalizing ties with Israel in 2020. A record number of Jews and Christians ascended the Temple Mount during the Feast of Tabernacles this year. Mount Moriah is the holiest site in Judaism, but it's controlled by the Islamic Waqf, which heavily restricts non-Muslim access and strictly forbids Jews and Christians from praying there. Advocacy groups have become more vocal in their demands for freedom of religion on Mount Moriah and regular access to the Temple Mount. The move has inspired more Jews and Christians to visit the holy site than ever before. In just one day alone, over 1,400 Jews and Christians made their way up to where the first and second Jewish temples once stood. The Israeli Defense Forces has announced that it has identified the remains of a soldier killed in the War of Independence 75 years ago. Dove Broder was an armored vehicle driver whose convoy was attacked by Arabs during the battle for Kfar Saba in 1948. Broder was listed as killed in action, although his remains were not identified. The IDF never gave up searching for the missing soldier, and it used genetic testing and clues from interviews with Broder's wife and fellow soldiers to identify his body, which had been buried in an anonymous soldier's grave in Segula Cemetery in Petach Tikva. Major General Yaniva Sor of the IDF Personnel Directorate personally delivered the news to Broder's 95-year-old widow, Batia. A formal memorial ceremony will be held at Broder's final resting place where the family and the IDF will leave a gravestone in his name. The Feast of Tabernacles concluded this weekend with the celebration of Hoshana Rabbah, where Jews bid farewell to the Sukkah. The following days, Jews observed the culmination of the High Holy Days with Simchat Torah. Now, this special holiday is a celebration of Moses receiving the Torah from God at Mount Sinai. It signifies the end of the annual cycle of weekly Bible readings and the beginning of a new one. It's traditionally marked by dancing with Torah scrolls and studying the Bible. Jews read the final passages of Deuteronomy and then roll the scrolls back and immediately read the first verses from the book of Genesis. This act is meant to highlight the eternal nature of the Torah. More than 50,000 Jews received the Birkata Kohanim, or priestly blessing, at the Western Wall in the Old City of Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. 
This special prayer is said twice each year during the pilgrimage holidays of Passover and Sukkot. The Sukkot prayers are especially significant because they're recited while the Kohanim, or priests, take up the four species. The public recitation of Birkata Kohanim usually draws massive crowds, but the turnout this year was so great that organizers scheduled a second day of priestly prayers. More than 50,000 Jews flooded the Kotel Plaza to hear the priestly blessing, which says, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his face to you and give you peace. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned now for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Eliza Pilachowski. She is the mayor of Mitzpe Jericho. Eliza, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. So, Eliza, where is Mitzpe Jericho? Tell us about it. Okay, so if you're in Jerusalem and you're driving down to the Dead Sea, you're going to pass Malea Dumim on your right side, and on your left side, you're going to see Mitzpe Yericho. And from Mitzpe Yericho, you're going to see, you're going to have a perfect outlook of Jericho, the the modern day city, and of course the ancient city. You're going to see out to the Dead Sea, and you're going to see all the hills of Moab, where Moses stood and looked into Israel right before he died. People are talking a lot about Mitzpah Jericho lately. There's like new hotels, boutique hotels, little cottages. Uh, there's tours. There's like springs that people go to, uh, windy uh, roads with a lot of foliage. And, uh, you know, we saw Ibex there when I was there. It's, it's becoming a very exciting place. What's happening there? Is there a building boom? Uh, what's going on? Um, there is a building boom. Um, we we are situated in in Judea and Samaria, and it is one of the most exciting times, I would say, in Jewish history, seeing the Jewish people return to Judea and Samaria, seeing the growth. Um, Yes, as you said, there are all kinds of little boutique hotels, and it's incredible to see people returning, even the people that, the Israelis that have been living in Israel for all these years that have been living, you know, in in a town, in a city, outside of Judea and Samaria and all of a sudden are coming back and are being able to really enjoy it. So we've seen tremendous growth um, over the past couple of years. We've seen 100 new homes built, um, 100 new families move in. We're we're in the midst of building another 365 units, which, please God, we will we will build and we will have families moving in within the next three to five years. We're working on the next building project. We we just completed and are waiting just for the electricity to be hooked up to a new indoor sports complex. We built a, an outdoor swimming pool, um, and I can't even I can't even list all the building that that's going on. But I invite. You and all of the listeners to please come to Mitzvah Yericho, see it, experience it, and feel the excitement. Well, it's it's absolutely exciting, but it's not exciting to everyone. Uh, a lot of international condemnation for even building in Judea and Samaria these days. People call it the West Bank to try to confuse people where it actually is. Why do you think all of this is going on? Well, there are always the naysayers, but... I don't, I don't listen to naysayers. I believe in moving forward and working with what we have. We, we the Jewish people, were, were given Judea and Samaria by God. And now, as we return to Judea and Samaria, we see the hand of God every single day. When I look outside my window and I look in my front yard, I see the flowers, the grass, the trees that are growing. I see the desert blooming. We live in the desert and we see the green and the foliage and everything that God has given us. And it is the most amazing experience. So there are going to be naysayers and that's fine. But to me, to be able to sit and see all of these gifts that God has bestowed upon us that we get to experience every day is the most invigorating experience every single day. And for those naysayers who don't want to see Jews in the West Bank or in Judea and Samaria, I say, I don't buy that. I don't believe anywhere in the world should be Judenrein, should be free from Jews. We learned our lesson in Germany, and now in Israel, there is no way that there will be any place that will be Judenrein. 
We're seeing a lot of Christian Zionists coming to Israel. Bible-believing Christians uh, are coming in record numbers this year. Are they coming to uh, Mitzpah Jericho? They do. We are, for for those of you who read the Bible daily, you will know that Mitzvah Yericho is actually right after Good Samaritan. So if you're coming from Jerusalem and you're driving down, the the interchange right before Mitzvah Yericho is the Good Samaritan. Is the Good Samaritan. So we get lots of people. We have the St. George uh, Monastery, and we have all kinds of great Christian sites, and of course, just the whole land. Everywhere where you walk in Judea and Samaria and the land of Israel is a real gift. So we we see a lot of Christian visitors. And of course, everyone that's listening today would want to be able to come themselves. And I invite you and please call on me and I would love to meet you as well. You know, uh, one of the things that I thought was exciting about Mitzvah Jericho is that it's it's a very ancient place, but it's also very modern. There's a lot of, like, really cool new things. I was on a safari bus uh, going down these windy roads. Uh, what's the future of Mitzvah Jericho? The future is in the hands of the people. But what I try to do is is represent the people and try to continue to build and build and build and build. So as we grow, we we change and we grow and we see all kinds of new new housing projects and new new facilities that we're able to to give serv- provide services for our residents. So as I said, we just we just completed the indoor sports complex. My next project is to get an indoor an indoor workout gym going. Um, and then we'll continue building. We need a senior center. We need a, just a, a, a community center where we'll be able to have clubs for seniors and youth and everybody in between. And we hope to continue to build and build. Aliza, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? My message is come to Israel, experience it, feel it, and specifically, you are invited to Mitzvah Yericho. I'd love to see you. Aliza, thank you for being on the show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the truth from Zion. Today, the Ottoman Empire is known as Turkey. Following World War I, the so-called war to end all wars, victorious allied powers, France, Great Britain, the United States, Russia, Italy, and Japan, decided the fate of the former territories of the Ottoman Empire. On the other side stood Germany and Austria-Hungary. The allies wanted to dismantle the defeated Ottoman Empire as it had aligned itself closely with Germany. People don't often think much about the origins of borders in the Middle East. It was only a century ago that these countries were established as we know them today. It all happened at the San Remo Conference that took place in April of 1920. This pivotal moment shaped the future of the Middle East. The diplomatic gathering in the city of San Remo, Italy, laid the groundwork for serious territorial and political changes for Israel and the entire Middle East region. Prime ministers from Great Britain and France participated in this large-scale event, along with representatives from Japan, Greece, and Belgium. During the conference, two mandates were endorsed, separating the territories of the old Ottoman province. The northern sections, which became today's Syria and Lebanon, were under the authority of France, while the southern half was to be called Palestine and was mandated to Great Britain, which also had control of what is now known as Iraq. The idea was to offer these countries independence while being under a temporary, already established power. During the conference, leaders redefined borders and the way certain areas in the region would be governed, resulting in a new order. The new countries were told they would be supported until ready to govern themselves. Of course, not everyone agreed with this decision. For example, King Faisal of Damascus, the capital of Syria, opposed the French mandate. In response, The French army threw him out of the country by force. The League of Nations split the former Ottoman Empire into nation states that had never existed before. Today, you would recognize them as Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel. We don't question their legitimacy now, but in 1920, the borders for these countries had just been carved out. The conference recognized the principle of self-determination, acknowledging different ethnic groups in the Middle East and trying to realize their aspirations for statehood. 
Nevertheless, many tribes and peoples were separated by these newly created borders. Aside from establishing areas for groups to live and self-govern, the San Remo Conference also provided a dialogue to discuss the creation of the modern state of Israel. The Balfour Declaration was written three years before the conference on November 2, 1917. Arthur Balfour, the British Foreign Secretary at the time, declared in writing that His Majesty's government views with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Even though the document had been written, no action was taken during those three years. However, at the San Remo Conference, the doctrine was reviewed and endorsed by the powerful dignitaries in the room. The San Remo Conference is responsible for much of what we see as the Middle East today. Michael Oren, Israel's former ambassador to the United States and a former member of the Knesset, believes the San Remo Conference was pivotal in the creation of the State of Israel. The San Remo Conference was crucial because it represented, for the first time, international recognition, A, of the existence of a Jewish people, not Jewish religion, but a Jewish people, and a Jewish people endowed with an inalienable right to self-determination in our homeland. That recognition is not in the UN Partition Resolution of 1947. It's not in the Camp David Accords of 1979. It's certainly not in the Oslo Accords of 1993. That recognition of a Jewish people that has a right to self-determination in our homeland that is embedded now in international law. By this time in 1920, the League of Nations had existed for about five months, and it played a significant role in assigning territories west of the Jordan River to Great Britain. That area is called Judea and Samaria and clearly marked within the borders of Israel. Although the international community continues to falsely call these areas the West Bank. The legacy of the San Remo Conference highlights the intricacies of post-war diplomacy and the delicate balance between the interests of global superpowers. But for Jews, it was the recognition of the Jewish people, not just as a religion, but also as a nation. Even so, people who study the Bible have known about the nation of Israel for thousands of years before this conference took place. And now, Shining Light from Israel. God tells Joshua to come to Shiloh, place the tabernacle here. This becomes the center of the 12 tribes. Hi, I'm Eliana and welcome to Ancient Shiloh. We're about to embark on a journey through time. We're going to be going back 3,500 years in time to the time that this was Israel's first capital. Follow me. For 40 years, the children of Israel were wandering through the desert with Moses leading them. They crossed the Jordan with Joshua bin Nun, enter Israel, and establish Israel's first capital city here in Shiloh. For 369 years, this is the center for the 12 tribes. So how do we know that this is Shiloh? When an archaeologist comes to an ancient biblical site, they have a dream to find three things. A reference in the Bible, an inscription, and the preservation of the ancient Hebrew name. Here we found all three. Let's look at the verse in the Bible. In the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 19. And there was the festival of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh, which was north of Beit El, east of the highway that goes from Beit El to Shechem, and on the south of Levona. The highway, we see today the modern Highway 60, is in the exact same location as the ancient biblical highway. So that's how we know that this is Shiloh. 
But what's really significant about Chilo is that the tabernacle stood here just beneath us. The tabernacle was a portable temple for the 40 years in the desert. And here it's a semi-permanent structure. Here for almost 400 years, this is where the children of Israel congregated three times a year and was the center for the 12 tribes. Walking through ancient Chilo, you can feel the history. If you stand here long enough, they say that you can still smell the incense from the time of the tabernacle. I'm holding 3,500 years of history in the palms of my hand. These are pieces of pottery that belong to Jewish families that came here three times a year when this was Israel's capital and the site of the tabernacle. They'd offer their offerings and break the dishes. We found hundreds of pieces of pottery in our backyard, just behind me over here. We live overlooking the site of the tabernacle. Every time I come here, every time I pick up these pieces of the pottery, it's truly exciting. If you're familiar with the story of Hannah from the book of Samuel, then you'll realize that this is where prayer began. Hannah stood here 3,500 years ago and spoke to God. Eli the high priest had no idea what she was doing because before that time, people would come to offer sacrifices. There was no prayer. She's granted with a child, Samuel, who grows up here in the Mishkan, here in the tabernacle, becomes a prophet, will later anoint King David and build Jerusalem. In addition to exploring the archeology span in this site, we have this beautiful museum. There's a great movie that tells the story of the biblical site. We have a beautiful picnic area. There's a gift shop. I think it's the most beautiful gift shop in Israel with unique and special gifts. They all have to do with the Mishkan, with the tabernacle, Shiloh and Hannah. If you have more time and like to explore our beautiful region, the region of Binyamin, the Benjamin Regional Council, you can hop into an ATV, drive through the gorgeous vineyards, stop off for a swim in one of our beautiful springs, and continue on bike or hiking through the mountains. We hope to see you soon here in Shiloh and in the Binyamin region. We're waiting for you. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.